Jack them up, boys. This is Ephesians chapter 2 is where we're at. And uh, we're going to, of course, start in the first verse. If you have a Spirit-filled life Bible, you can follow along with what I'm going to read. It's, in the, it's after the first verse in chapter uh, 2. It's a spiritual responsibility. Um, this particular chapter uh, is, is by grace through faith. <clears throat> spiritual responsibility, human worth, divine destiny... The creature of God. Now, I want you to listen to this because this is so important for where we're at in the body of Christ and where we need to be and where Ephesians is trying to bring us to uh, in this. Re remember a couple of things. Paul was dealing with Gentiles. Ephesus was a, a place where uh, not only was there pagan worship, but there was worship where they worshiped other gods. Uh, much like Corinth, uh, all of that part of the world, uh, they, they worshiped mythological gods um, or what we call mythological gods. They were what they considered to be real to them. Uh, Zeus and, and uh, uh, all of the, the gods like that. Human worth, divine destiny. The creature that God created in man is enabled to respond to him. Man becomes a responsible being. He is qualitatively and differently a different sort of being. Endowed with the ability and a freedom to fellowship and to participate in the life of God. Man, I mean, this is how God created us, to participate in the life of God. And one of the things that is so important as, as we read on in this and then get into the second chapter of, of Ephesians, I want you to begin to look at yourself differently. I have people all the time that they'll talk a certain way when they're around me. And then they'll, they'll make some kind of comment and I'm not even going to uh, throw some comments out there. They'll make some kind of comment, and then they'll look at me and go, but bless God, and then they'll quote what the Bible says. This is talking about God created us to be able to respond to Him in the God kind of life. The God kind of life simply believes that God is who He says He is. God is, will do what He says He can do. And that's who He is in me. That's how He created Adam and Eve, was to respond to Him as gods of this earth. Doing exactly what He had created them to do. Doing, operating in that place that He had put them. And that's what He wants you and I to do. That's exactly what we're going to see in this chapter. And that's why I'm reading this first, because it's so important for us to look at the chapter with a different light. Because for so long, people have looked at the second chapter of Ephesians as simply a salvation chapter. We're going to look at some things tonight that we're going to see. And if you don't think I'm excited, I spent about four hours in an airport today studying this and I got so excited that people were looking at me funny around uh, around me he he is a qualitatively qualitatively and different sort of being endowed with the ability and the freedom to fellowship and participate in the God kind of life in other words God didn't create a puppet God created Adam to respond to him, but it gave him the choice to do what he was going to do. This is not the freedom of individual autonomy, which denies dependence on God, nor is it the freedom behind the fall of man, as in the case of Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3. And we all know what happened in Genesis chapter 3. If you don't, read it at home. Adam and Eve were given the freedom to respond to God following their disobedience, but instead attempted to hide from Him. Did you ever think about that? What did they do? 
They went and hid. When covered herself up. Instead of just saying, Lord, we messed up. See, there was even not, not even any repentance in that place. Instead, there was a place of hiding. Do you know that... Uh, it, it, this is, and this is kind of a side note, but this is kind of how, how we, we treat God. Do you know that there's one person that's important in the entire universe? When you do something or say something, it's not me. His name is Jehovah. His name is Jesus Christ. His name is the Holy Ghost. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, Adam's trying to hide from the Creator. Sin is the disobedience that severs man's fellowship with God. Sin confuses and distorts our humanity and obstructs the emergence of true personhood by interrupting our fellowship with God. That's exactly what, what happens. Now, I want, you to, I want you to think about this because he's fixing a time. Let's go ahead and, and read this first and then we'll, I'll make a comment. But when the power of sin is broken by accepting Christ's various acts of obedience, a vicarious acts of obedience, at Calvary, grace is revealed and the true order of humanity is restored. See, that's what was done at the cross. The true order of humanity or fellowship with God was restored. And think about how he created Adam. He didn't just create a perfect being. He created somebody that was in divine health, somebody that didn't have any needs, put gold and, and uh, bellum and onyx over between the rivers even before there was a Walmart to spend the money at. Christ came to authenticate human, humanity in order for us to be in full communion with God. What does full communion with God mean to you? It should mean that everything becomes perfect again because that's exactly what the blood of Christ did. These truths are summarized by the Apostle Paul, who says that by, that, that by nature, the human condition of mankind was dead, enslaved, and condemned. This is, we're going to see this in the first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2. But then, by the grace of God, in Christ, in His divine compassion, man is saved, made alive, raised and made to sit with him in eternal fellowship and purpose. God created us to sit in eternal fellowship and purpose. So, uh, having read that, let's go, let's go into the first verse. And you, be made, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. In which, so now I want, remember this, there's another place that Paul made this comment. He said, you died to Christ. So there's two different ways to think about this. He made us alive to Christ, but we died from the old man into Christ. And that's what being made alive by Christ was, is, is everything else that doesn't line up with how Adam and Eve was create, were created in, in the garden died and became alive again to exactly how Adam and Eve were created. Somebody says, well, you know, I, I, I come under attacks that Adam and Eve didn't. Well, there's still a God of this world. And so what I've got to do with the God of this world is I've got to walk in, a, in life in who Jesus Christ was so that the God of this world doesn't rule my life. His attacks cannot bear fruit, which means the things that, that I do have to line up with what God says so that I will respond to the God kind of life. To, I will respond to God and what he's done. In which 
you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by the nature by nature children of wrath just as others. So let's look at uh, the what it says about uh, I touched the wrong thing. Here we go. What it says about the mind. There could, because if, if you notice, if you've got a Spirit-filled Life Bible, you'll notice in that place there's a, a, a little colon there. And that tells you to go to uh, the word wealth in Mark 12, 30. And this is the, the meaning of the mind. It says, literally, a thinking through. It combines mind and dia through the word suggests understanding insight, meditation, reflection, perception, the gift of apprehension, the, uh, the faculty of thought. When this faculty is renewed by the Holy Spirit, the whole mindset changes from the fearful negativism of the carnal mind to the vibrant, positive thinking of the quickened spiritual mind. And if that don't make you want to run, there's nothing that will. Because I'm going to tell you, what that says is everything that negatively comes out of my mouth lines up with the carnal mindset and it comes into a place that I begin to have the God kind of thinking. I begin to have the right kind of thinking because it says that it comes to positive thinking quickened by the spiritual mind. Your mind should be spiritually renewed through Christ Jesus and through a relationship with Him. Um, by the way, I'm reading the Bible out of here because somewhere while I've been gone, my Bible disappeared, but, which means I'll probably find it in Kathleen's office some, someplace um, because I, I think I left it in her car. Anyway, let's go on. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because his great love with which he loved us. So again, there's a, there's a semicolon, and this, this stood out when we look at mercy. It, you go to 2 Timothy 1.16, if, you, if you're following along in the word wealth. Word wealth is always the meaning from the Greek of in, in a Spirit-filled Life Bible of what uh, that, that word means. Uh, mercy is elos. It means compassion, tender, kindness, uh, benefice, and outward manifestation of pity. The word is used of God, of Christ, and of men. So what we see is his mercy towards us was built on an understanding or a pity towards us that we needed to have change because of everything that's going that was going on and that has continued to go on uh, from from the fall from who the God of this world is. Then it says but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love. So let's look at the love in this place. And it comes to a Ro uh, Romans 5, 5 in the word wealth. <coughs> and somehow I cha changed the page to the wrong place. Well... Sometimes I don't like some things about this this thing because all of a sudden it turns a page instead of goes going to where I want it to go to.
<laughs> I love this. It's trying to get me to uh, do a note instead of a... Uh, Okay, here we go. Love, agape, a word to which Christianity, and all of us know the meaning of agape, but a word to which Christianity gave new meaning. Outside of the New Testament, it rarely occurs in existing Greek manuscripts of the period. Agape denotes an undefeated, an undefeatable benevolence and unconquerable Goodwill that always seeks the highest good of the other person. No matter what he does, it is the self-giving love that gives freely without asking anything in return and does not consider the worth of its object. You know, that, just th that throws a whole wrench in what the devil tries to tell you, you're not worthy. Well, you know, look what you said or look what you thought or look what you did. It said that from the very meaning of the word, it says it does not consider the worth of its object. Agape is more a love by choice than phileos, phileos which is the love by chance. And it, it refers to the will rather than the emotion. Agape describes the unconditional love that God has for the world. <clears throat> so, then we look at it, and it says, so let's read this again. But God, who was rich in mercy, gave, because of his great love with which he loved us, and loved us, goes all the way back to John 3.16 and says, and I should have just stayed in the place instead of... Loved, it, it was agapio, and it's an unconditional love by choice, an act of the will. It, see... It's exactly the same thing as, as agape was. But it's God's love towards us that caused us to walk in His mercy to return to the very same place that He created us in the very beginning. And this is so rich in Ephesians. And, and this is the reason that we're looking at Ephesians because God did some things that we have only equated with sin. But God cre brought us back to a place because of His love that we were in a position to have a, a relationship with Him, a communion with Him, and a communion with everything that He created us to have in, in the very beginning. Verse 6 is, and raised us up together and made us sit together. I love this. In heavenly places with Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. So stopping right there, let's go back to chapter 1. And uh, verse 20. If you notice, right there in, in heavenly places, there is, a, there is a, an A, and that A takes us back. The, the reference is chapter 1, verse 20. It says, Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. <coughs> 
And so when we look at this, we see that Paul reiterated that he brought us to sit in heavenly places right just exactly, you remember the, the um, bad art that I did la the week before last? At least Michael remembers the bad art where I drew the body and the head. and so This is exactly what Paul's talking about. He's caused us to sit in heavenly places. It's not about going to heaven when we, when we uh, die, but it's talking about walking in heavenly places right now where the enemy is under our feet. And that's one of the things that he has reestablished in our life. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceedingly the exceedingly riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace have you been saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. Now, if you notice that that word is highlighted in the in the, and, and underlined, which means right under it is the meaning. If you're not familiar with your spirit-filled life Bible, workmanship is uh, to make. The word signified that which is a, was manufactured, a product, a design by by an artisan emphasizes God as the master designer, the universe as his creation, and the redeemed believer as his new creation. Before conversion, our, our lives had no rhyme or no reason. Conversion brought us balance, symmetry, and order. We are God's poem and artwork. And so you, you see exactly from we're his workmanship. We, we realize that simply what faith means, and you, and you can see there's an there's a, a, a asterisk by that too. Faith simply means the conviction, confidence and the conviction that what God says is true and will come to pass. So if, if I have confidence and conviction that I'm saved, now the, the word saved in this place um, was if I can remember how to get this down I'm going to read the meaning to you was uh, sozo who, who remembers what sozo means everybody going to talk at once Sozo -so is another word for, yes, it's, an, it's another word for uh, salvation. And, and it simply says that health, prosperity, safe thinking, and general well-being. And so when we look at that, we realize that exactly what Paul was saying here in Ephesians to us was that we're his workmanship because he said it's through faith that we're saved. It wasn't that we're saved from just sin. But saved was the word sozo. So we were saved from sickness. We were saved from stinking thinking. We were saved from all of the things that attack us today. So I've got to come into a place that I understand if I'm his workmanship that I am his creation, I am God's poem, I am his artwork. Do you think that God did artwork that was not perfect? Hello? Okay. No, he didn't. And I know that this, is, this isn't new revelation, but there's so many times that the enemy comes against us that we've got to get in a position that we understand, you know what, you can't stay here and you can't attack me like that because you do not have the right. Amen. So we come into the place that I understand. If he doesn't have the right, then he is an intruder in God's creation and I will not 
have it and I won't agree with him. So, again, it's so important, the things that come out of our mouth. Are you a new creation in Christ? Or do you continue to have what, uh, what the enemy's trying to tell you you have? Um, let's go on to... Uh, I didn't finish verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ... For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What are good works? Well, you guys are quiet tonight. There you go. That is good. Doing what the Father does. The meaning of good is in a physical and moral sense, which produces benefits. The word is used of a person, things, acts, conditions, and so on. The synonym is good Suggesting act, act, attractiveness and excellence. So we look at that and we realize that exactly what Paul said in this place. He said that we were created to be excellent. You know, that's not just overcoming sin. That's overcoming sickness. That's overcoming everything that comes against uh, our bodies uh, against whether it's finances, whether it's uh, and and the, and the biggest playground is is stinking thinking. Coming into a place that we realize that I've got to either agree with God or I've got to agree with the devil. Now that choice isn't hard for me. I don't believe that you that that choice is hard for you. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been on an airplane all day and uh, the air was really dry. So, it says God, God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It was God's plan. You remember the, the chapter before, it, it talked about being predestined. Predestined simply means that God had a plan that we would be excellent and we would walk in everything that he had created for us to walk in. Told Adam to have dominion over. Verse 11 says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision, made by the flesh of hands, that at that time... You were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. And, and, and that says a lot right there because all of a sudden we come into a place that we understand that I don't have any hope of overcoming these things because when I was in the world. But because I'm in Christ, not only do I have hope, but I'm predestined. God's plan is for me to walk in what he's given me. So now I've got to try to change my way of thinking to come into a place that I think like God thinks. And the only way to do that is to by feed yourself on what the word says about you. Because we change exactly what uh, is the condition of my thought life by putting God's word in and not listening to everything that everybody else has to say, not listening to, I'm a, I'm a guy that loves country music. I love old country music. Well, I find out that if I listen to too much of it, everybody's uh, cheating on their wife, uh, getting drunk and, and about to get divorced. 
And, and what you got to do is you got to, and, and I use that for an example, because a lot of times we dwell on what the doctor says, what the, what the news says. Um, you know, I went a whole week, I, I couldn't even watch the news because it wouldn't work uh, where I was at. And uh, it only took me about five minutes on the airplane where they had uh, the news going. Uh, and and I, the first plane I was on today uh, had a little television right there in front of me. And uh, immediately Fox News came up and it took me five minutes to turn it off. Because I thought, I had a whole lot better thinking for a whole week without listening to what's going on. Don't dwell on what the doctor says. Don't dwell on what the news is telling you is going on with finances. You know, all of a sudden I heard someplace else, they said the economy was getting so much stronger. But if you listen to the news, it's not getting a whole, whole lot stronger. Instead, you begin to, and so you've got to feed yourself on the right things so that I can realize I'm in Christ. I am changed. God has created me to be excellent in everything that I do. Now I've got to figure out where I was. Yeah, but I was trying to figure out if I'd turned a page and got out of Ephesians. No, I haven't. <clears throat> okay. Verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. See, if we, when we had no hope, because we didn't have our mind renewed, go to, you can go to Romans 12, 2. It says, by the renewing of our mind. Um, when you look at that verse, it, it tells you that uh, don't be conformed to the world's way of thinking is what, it, what, the, what that actually means from the Greek. So if I'm not going to be conformed to the world's way of thinking, then I've got to have my mind renewed so that I begin to think like God thinks. And you say, well, how can I think like God thinks? We feed on His Word. We listen to what His Spirit says. His Spirit will begin to direct us. If we'll feed ourselves on the Word, we don't have to just say, well, God, give me a word. God, give me a word. We begin to feed on His Word, and then all of a sudden, somebody will say something, and it will crawl all over you, and you'll go, no, that's not right. And I've been with some people uh, over the last week that they, they would say things that, crawled all over me and the very first thing I did I didn't wait till I walked away but I said right then well the Bible says it, remember what Jesus did whenever they, when Satan came to him and he began to tempt him what did he say it's written it's written he didn't wait until Satan got away he said right then it's written what he did was he quoted what his father said and if we'll quote what our Father says about us, because we've been putting it in, not just something we've heard somebody else say, but something that we begin. Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth speak. That's what Jesus said. So out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth speak doesn't mean that I make a, a negative. Remember we read one of the words of that mean, meaning of one of those words was not to be negative in our confessions, but to be positive in what God says. Be positive in the way that God's mind. So what that means is I, it's not good enough that I say, I heard somebody the other day, they said, uh, they had lupus. They said, my lupus. And, and, and they were, they're a Christian. And they've had all the teaching. And when they said, my lupus, they looked at me. See, somehow, somehow people think, Tanya already knows what I'm going to say probably because she's grinning. They looked at me and they said, yes, I have lupus and I, it's just mine and walked away. And I thought, well, bless God, that'll be yours then. But the Bible says by his stripes I was healed. So if I was healed, then I can't, I may be being attacked in my body of something, but it's not mine. And I'm not going to continue to walk in that place because my confession isn't, well, I got lupus, and I'm using that for an example just because somebody said that the other day. And, and, but what I do is I realize that it's not mine. 
It is an attack on my body. And my father says that I have saved you. I have sent the blood of Jesus. I have sent his broken body that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That well, and, and what saved means, we just read it. Sozo means health, prosperity, and general well-being. So what this chapter is talking about, and even though in some places it refers to sin, from all the meanings of the word, it's talking about the whole package. He's telling the Ephesians, you have been saved. You've had health, prosperity, and general well-being, safe thinking uh, in that place that we come into. What, what did uh, Paul tell, or Timothy uh, right. He said, not been given the spirit of fear, but that of love and of power and a same sound mind. Well, that word love there was the same love that we just looked at. That was agape that says the highest and best thinking towards the one that I'm giving it to for excellence. And so when we come in and we realize that exactly what we're doing is we're coming into that place. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. There is no separation between God and us. That was, that was what he was showing on the day that Christ was crucified and the, the holy of holies was ripped from the top to the bottom. It, it, he was showing that there's no separation at all between us and him and where he wants us to be. He wants us to be in that place that we have God kind of thinking in everything that we do. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law commands contained in ordinances so as to create for himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. That he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, putting to death the enmity. He, became, he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. You know, I need to look at something and see if there was a, a note that... I, I'm reading out of the Bible and not, not out of my notes, and so I want to make sure that I... There was something that really stood out We're good. <clears throat> Verse 14. Nope. Where was I at? 19. Now, therefore, you who are, are no longer strangers and foreigners. I want you to think about that word. Underline that word foreigners for a minute. But Except for in a, if you have a spirit-filled life Bible, it is already. For fellow, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Foreigners is a word that was taken from the word that said beside and to dwell. Hence, dwelling near, the word came to denote an alien who dwells as a sojourner in a land without the rights of citizenship. The word describes Abraham and Moses, sojourners in a land that was not their own. And the Christian who is traveling through the world is as an alien whose citizenship ultimately reside in heaven. And I looked at that and I thought about this. You look at this. He says, you, therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Well, who do, what rights do the household of God have? 
Let's do this a different way. What rights do your sons and daughters have to everything that you have? Complete. There's nothing. You know, and I guess the part, part of that, that that's hard is because some of us may have sons and daughters that, that aren't serving the Lord, so we might hold back a little bit uh, or, or in reservation. But the fact is that when we look at love, the agape kind of love that says that it doesn't see whether you're worthy or not, then we realize that God has given us complete access as sons and daughters to everything that is His and everything that He created for us. Is that right? So when you say yes, and only you know this because only you know what you think when nobody else is around. What do you think in the dark? Do you think you have complete access? When you're by yourself, do you think that you have the access to everything that God has created you, for you? Or do you think that some people do, but, but I don't really have that kind of access? And that's what I'm trying to, tr trying to change tonight. And this is the thing that got me so excited about the second chapter of Ephesians is because I look and he's, he's given us complete access there is no reservation. The only reservation that there is is in how I act and how I respond. Because when we looked at the meaning of the words, and that's why I read that first part. If you don't have a word, uh, uh, Spirit-Filled Life Bible, find somebody that does. I'll run you a copy of that first thing that I read. And when it, when it talked about having complete access to God, having complete ability to respond to what God said. And, and when, I, when I went back and I studied out Adam and, and Eve, I realized that they even had a choice at how they responded to God after they ate of the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and, they, and how they responded had everything to do with what happened next. But God loved them so much that he went ahead and he laid that blood against them as a, as a type and a shadow of things that were to come to show them that he still loved them and he still cared about them. And he, he even took something that he created to get that skin. And so we realize that it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a fact that whether they were worthy or not, but it was a fact of God's love, unconditional love that wanted the highest and the best for them. And that's exactly what he did through Jesus Christ in our lives. Verse 20 says, Having been built on a foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building fit together grows into a holy temple for the Lord in whom you also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. God has created you to be a dwelling place for His Spirit. I went out, uh, I took some classes while I was, uh, I was gone, and, and uh, they were uh, very intense. Um, and the first day, uh, in this in this class I was in, um, I realized that they par partnered us up with 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 some people uh, because my partner didn't show up. My partner was Keith Brown, and he got put in the wrong class, and so he wasn't there. So I got they part me, partnered me up with this guy. Well, he fumbled all day. Had a pro it, it was actually a a, a a pistol class, and and. And this guy, he, he jammed his gun, he, he fumbled all day long, and I realized that I, I struggled all day. 
I struggled bad enough the first day that I thought, man, I don't know if I want to come back tomorrow. But I came back the next day and they part me, partnered me up with another guy. And this guy did everything right. He wanted to be excellent in what he did. And, and I realized it brought me to a new level in the way I was thinking. And it was a perfect example of who we surround ourselves with and what we do. Don't look to somebody who's fumbling through life from sickness to sickness, from being broke to broke, from this, from anything that doesn't line up with the Word of God. Partner yourself up with somebody who brings you to a new level. Because at the end of the day, I had gone to a new place. And I said, Lord, I realize now that you were showing me something in that, see, because we're led by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. So the third day when I went back, I said, Father, you just help me to be able to remember everything that you've shown me through this time that I'll come to a new place. And, and, and my score was perfect on everything that I did. And, and I did no partners that day. It was, I mean, it was me. And that's one of the things that you realize is when you get partnered up with somebody that begins to speak negative things, then pretty soon you're thinking negative. You remember what I said about how much I love old country music. But I realize that I have to be very limited on what I listen to because otherwise I get stinking thinking. And, and when we get stinking thinking, it's not good. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care who you're with. I don't care what part of life it is. Pretty soon you become negative in everything you're doing. And we've got to be filled with the God Spirit. God created us. This last verse says... Built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So God has built us, created us to be His dwelling place. And I realize that God is not negative about anything. So if you have negative thoughts, negative confessions, then get rid of them and get around somebody who speaks the positive Word of God. Speaks the... Every time... And I love the relationship that my wife and I have because every time there's a, a negative thought or a, a negative uh, thing that comes to about in, uh, in what I'm doing, there's always, this is, this is the, the, the comment. We don't want to think about that. See, and that's what we've got to do. We've got to get in a place that we understand, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to dwell on what the doctor said. I don't want to dwell on uh, if, if the world thinks we're going, to, you know, I, don't, I haven't participated in a recession yet. I don't intend to. I'm not going to be, uh, do it. My Bible says that God's kids have never been caught. God's children have never been caught begging bread in the street. I just like to call them kids because we're just his kids. The Bible says we're uh, sons and, and daughters. Um, I remember now what I really wanted to read. And we're coming to a place that uh, um, I, I, I told Kathleen, I said, you know, I, I want you to fix communion for tonight because um, it's important for us to understand. If God's brought us back to having an opportunity to respond to him. See, that's all a relationship is. Um, you know, if you have a friendship with somebody, it can't be one-sided. Is that right? Because if you have a one-sided friendship, then you really don't have a friendship. You just are, are stroking somebody and trying to make them feel good, and you're trying to be their friend, and they really don't want to be your friend. So that's exactly what a relation... When we talk about a relationship with God, we're talking about responding to what God wants. Responding to God doesn't want you to say, well, I won't do this and I won't do that and I won't do this other thing. Instead, what he wants to do is he wants you to respond to the positive things that he thinks about you. He thinks that you're the greatest thing that ever happened. I, you know, I, I tell Kathleen all the time and, and um, this is in, and, I, and I believe that this is exactly what the Lord says about each one of us. Um, I tell Kathleen, I said, you know what? I think you're the neatest thing that ever walked on two legs. 
And I believe that God thinks that about every one of us. You're the greatest thing that I ever created. And, and the cool thing is that he thinks that about all of us. And, and uh, I just like to tell everybody that I'm his favorite. Um, but I realize that um, you're his favorite too. Um, back in uh, one of these uh, word wells that I read, there at the bottom of them, you'll see there's a couple of uh, scriptures. I was trying to see what this word wealth was called so you could actually uh, see it. It's kingdom dynamics embraced by Christ's sacrifice, the blood. And I may not have read this. Prior to the new covenant, Gentiles were excluded from citizenship in the commonwealth of Israel. I did. Um, so at the bottom of that, uh, and, I, and I believe that this was significant too, and this is why I wanted to have communion. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 18 uh, w was one of the references. Um, and if you're not familiar with the kingdom dynamics, there, there'll always be two references at the bottom. The first one is the one before this scripture in the chain, and the, the second one is the one that follows this scripture in the chain. And both of them tied completely together in what that we had been restored to having a to respond to God just like Adam and Eve did. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 18 says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we Though many are one bread and one body, for we partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? Now, in this place, Paul was addressing idolatry where the, the Corinthians were, were eating meat and things that had been sacrificed to idols. And, but when he said this one thing in verse 18, are not all those who eat the sacrifices partakers of the altar? We're partakers of the altar that Christ Jesus gave for you and I. We're partakers. That's what communion means. We're partaking. We're having fellowship with exactly what, what Christ did for us. Then the, the next scripture in that chain was 1 Corinthians 1.20. And it says, By him to reckon all, reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So if I could have a, a couple of people that would come and help me tonight and instead of a, maybe Toy and Tanya, would you come help me please? Uh, or you can, would you serve communion? It's over there on uh, uh, the back by the... What we realize is that by partaking of the altar, what is the altar? that we're talking about. What Jesus did at the cross. What Jesus, you know, if he never rose from the dead, it wouldn't have meant anything. But because he rose from the dead, he was quickened by the Spirit and made alive. What he did was he changed everything in yours, yours and my life. Made us to sit in heavenly places is what Ephesians chapter 2 said. And, and, and uh, then we looked back even at the, the first chapter. We realized that because of that, what I want to do is I want to change your thinking. Uh, and, and, and I might be preaching to the choir tonight. But I really believe what the Lord spoke to me is there's been some that have had good confessions in most areas, but... Not all of their confessions had lined up with what the Word says. 
And he said, get rid of the, the confessions that don't line up with my word because I've caused you to sit in heavenly places. I've caused you to rise to a new level. And so if that's you, then I want you to, when we get done with communion, never let that negative part come out of your mouth again. But instead, let the word of God come out of your mouth. It's written. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I've been made to have be a partaker of the altar of the cross and the, and the fellowship with him rising from the dead. When he rose from the dead, he went up to heaven. God seated him at the right hand, put, put the principalities and powers under his feet. And you and I are part of the feet. You and I are part of that body. And so I become a partaker of everything that he did. And, and not to even... What will happen if you'll continue to renew your mind? Then what will happen is you'll begin to change every way that you look at everything. Every way that you change. Everything that the doctor says, it'll become something that's foreign to you. Everything that uh, the ne constant negative news says, it'll become foreign to you. Because you're not a foreigner to God. You're not a foreigner in life. Jesus prayed over the, the disciples in chapter 17 of, of John. And what he said was, Father, they're not of the world. They're in the world. See, that's what Ephesians is telling us is I'm not of the world, but instead I am of the body of Christ. And, and that, that, uh, that becomes what I'm going to agree with in everything. I was trying to figure out where that shadow down there on the floor was coming from. It's a, a snowflake. You know, and I think about this when I, as I look around at all the snowflakes we've got hanging around and and how clean this, I, I was uh, landed in Salt Lake City today and there was snow all over the ground and how pure it looks and how good it, before people walk in it. And, and where that became a relationship was God has created you to have fellowship with what he's done at the cross. And then people traipse through it and they get it all dirty. And God doesn't want that to happen. He wants you to think like he thinks in everything. So as we take this, remember, you know, what the, what the body stands for and what the blood stands for. Um, you may have worry going on. There's no peace where there's worry. And it says he was chastised for our peace. So that's part of that, uh, that thing. I don't know who that was for, but... but uh, that uh, the Lord just spoke that into my spirit. So, Father, we thank you right now for what you've done. Father, we thank you that you have uh, brought us back to a place that you, we, you want us to be excellent in life. I thank you for excellence of life. Father, as we take this bread, help us to remember everything that it stands for. Father, and as we drink this cup, that we'll remember everything that it stands for. And Satan, I put you on notice that your uh, assignment has completely been canceled over these lives. In the name of Jesus and by his blood. Amen. Let's eat it and drink it together. And then the Bible says that they sang a song and they went out. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Father, I thank you for everything that you've done in us, through us. 
And Father, I pray over those that are here and those that are watching by internet, Father, that from this day on, if there's been any negative things going through their mind or coming out of their mouth, I bind them in the name of Jesus. And Father, loose safe thinking in everything they do. Remind them who you see them as. In the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood, amen. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the Word preached. And as you apply that Word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making Him your Savior and then making Him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The Word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior and He is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching, and so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make Him the Lord of your life. And as you make Him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation... Uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo. And uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you He'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord, and Jesus loves you, and so do we.